to welcome everyone to the um, uh, HICCC um, uh, Professional Enrichment Seminar Series. Um, we are very pleased and grateful to uh, John Martinez from uh, Columbia Tech Ventures office who has joined us today to talk to us about um, his office and, and uh, their role here at Columbia. Um, John uh, has his bachelor's in bioengineering from the University of Pennsylvania um, and his PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Utah. He's been working in tech transfer for about six years um, and he is uh, currently a technology licensing officer with Columbia Tech Ventures. Um, he works with numerous um, HICCC faculty members and has negotiated uh, many license deals for Columbia Technology. The number I have is greater than 50. If I have that incorrect, Juan, I apologize. Um, so we'd like to thank him very much for joining us today to uh, give this talk and I will hand over to uh, Juan. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emer. Um, I think the number is 51. Uh, I don't want it to be specific, but you know, just trying to be specific. Um, for this talk, I'd like to really just go over what technology transfer is. Um, first of all, I really like to cover the fact that uh, innovation flows out of universities in many different ways. So we're all familiar with publications, student internships, faculty consulting, sponsored research, but really there's also patents, licensing, and startups, which aren't really necessarily the focus of a university, but it's the focus of today's talk. So Columbia's tech transformation really is to facilitate the translation of academic research into the global market, into the practical applications in order to benefit society, both local, national, and globally. Uh, we do this at market rate terms in order to be able to fund internally research, education, and teaching at Columbia, and also just generally to serve as a resource for the Columbia community um, in the way that I'm doing right now, uh, given this talk. For those of you that joined late, this is usually another way to describing technology transfer, how to, how to monetize other kids' science projects. Before I continue, I just wanna say best practices for inventors, and really these are all the researchers that are at Columbia, researchers that are at uh, the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, these are the best practices. If you take away one slide or one piece of information from this talk, it really would be to File an invention report early before you, you, before you do a public disclosure. If you feel that you have a new invention, a new uh, discovery, something that may be patentable, something that may not be patentable, but maybe has a commercial potential to it, I would highly recommend that you talk to us before you disclose it publicly. And I'm gonna go into why in a second. Um, as ever, it's also a good practice to mark materials that you consider to be confidential uh, mark those as confidential and as proprietary information when you share them outside of the university. In short, file an invention report. This is really um, sort of the, the me main mechanism to interact with our office. So when I discuss tech transfer, I think it really helps to uh, just briefly go over what the history of tech transfer is, at least in the United States. Uh, before 1980, if your invention uh, at a university was federally funded, then that invention belonged to the federal agency that funded you. As you can imagine, uh, government might not necessarily be motivated or have the bandwidth to commercialize all innovations or all inventions that come out of universities. So in the end, the result was that only 5% of patents that were filed were ever commercialized. Uh, Congress tried to change that in 1980 by passing the Bayh-Dole Act, which gave nonprofits such as universities the rights and obligation to patent and try to commercialize federally funded inventions. Most universities uh, then included, brought in their policy to include all inventions, which Columbia has done. It's not just federally funded inventions that are um, subject to technology transfer policies. It's really all inventions that come out of the university. And really since its adoption, this law has, is what's really spurred the rapid adoption of these tech transfer offices uh, in American universities. So you can see here um, from 1980, this is, a, this is a chart of total patent grants to US universities uh, in the United States, uh, you know, by the United States Patent Office, by the year that's awarded. You can see starting in 1980, it takes about five years for a patent to be granted. Really that's what, where you started seeing a huge increase in the number of patents that universities were getting awarded. Um, and it was because the law essentially created a, an incentive for the universities to commercialize its own inventions. 
So where do universities really play in this space? So I'm showing here data that's from 1991 to 2015, so 25 years of data. Um, in that time, there have been about $850 billion in research funding, which have produced about 300,000 invention disclosures, 183,000 patent applications, 75,000 patents. And really the, the main result at the end is 40,000 active licenses and options, about 10,000 startups in these 25 years, and uh, at least 155 new drugs that were approved by the FDA in this period had some sort of university IP associated with them. So where does Columbia really fit into this space? So uh, Columbia Technology Ventures uh, reviews about 400 new inventions from Columbia researchers every year. Uh, we do about 100 license agreements or options, which are sort of a precursor to license agreements in an ideal world. Um, we also oversee 50, the creation of 15 new startup companies and receive millions in licensing revenue. So this should give you an idea of the scale at which Columbia Technology Ventures works. Uh, it's important to keep in mind through all this, and I'm going to go take a few slides to explain this, um, that the end of the process of Columbia uh, licensing a technology or spinning out a startup really is just the beginning of a new process. So in our funnel, in our internal university funnel, only about one in six inventions ever gets licensed. Um, but from that, um, it really begins the, pro the process of product development. And, and in the case of biotech devices or, or, or pharma compounds, it really is the beginning of the regulatory process. So as you might all might be familiar with, roughly only 1% of pharma compounds ever get approved. Only one in 10 venture investments is a significant hit. So of the few inventions uh, in our portfolio that do get licensed, there's even a, you know, a much uh, narrow funnel of what actually becomes a successful product that is on the market. So why is this so hard? Why is it so hard to go from an invention to a successful product or from an invention to a company that is up and running and really taking that invention uh, to the next level? Uh, and, and in this case, it's, it's important to familiarize, familiarize yourself with the concept of the valley of death. So if you see on this graph, um, you know, x-axis of time, y-axis is commercial value, um, really at the beginning of any invention or any sort of product, you're at the basic research stage. Um, then you're conducting your feasibility studies, you're doing some technical validations, and only at the end are you really going into the product development, marketing, and sales portion of the, of, of the process. And as you go through this, commercial value is increasing. As a lot of you may be familiar, uh, government and foundation grants really focus on this early stage, basic research, maybe some early feasibility studies, um, and, and work on these early stages. But beyond that, uh, these government and foundation grants don't typically focus on later stage um, development of a product. On the other side, there is industry and VC funding. So there is the you know, um, actual investment by industry and, um, and by VCs in, in actually getting a product out there. And this space in between where there's not really that much funding available to get it from one end of this uh, process to the other is what we call the valley of death, which is where unfortunately a lot of university innovations uh, end up and never leave. So our job as an office is really to try to get our inventions, get our uh, all the innovations that are coming out of Columbia past this valley and into the other side where it can really start to start the, the actual process of becoming a product that has a good impact on society. Uh, and this is a challenge that's familiar for faculty, you know, it, it, you, when you try to get an actual uh, development, it's grant money runs out, same, same way as happens with uh, commercial developments. So one of the other reasons this is really hard is because university technology really, really is on the bleeding edge. So uh, it takes a lot of time often for a technology to find a home. Um, 50%, less than 50% of our licenses are executed in the first two years. A lot of them are executed further on the line, which you can see from the graph here. And for these um, blockbusters, blockbuster drugs, which are usually defined as drugs that um, produce more than a billion dollars a year in sales, are really the ones that are driving their revenue. Uh, but they're exceedingly rare. Of you know all the active licenses that universities have out there, less than 0.5% are generating more than dollars a year. And that goes back to this whole idea of the valley of death and the, the tight funnel that there is to actually develop a product uh, and get a product on the market, at least at the very least in the life sciences. 
as you might imagine, uh, commercial success for universities doing tech transfer is not equally distributed. So this is a chart of the 2016 uh, tech transfer revenues for uh, 162 US institutions. I believe those are the ones usually defined as national universities that are PhD granting and have significant amount of uh, research funding. As you can tell from this graph, the vast, vast majority of universities are not making a significant amount of revenue through technology transfer. Um, Columbia is the university in blue there. And, um, you know, uh, we're, so that ranks us at about four or fifth. And this was in 2016, so the numbers have changed since then. Uh, but Columbia, generally speaking, is among the most active universities. So here I, I, I'm sharing the inventions per, uh, as a, controlled by research expenditures, inventions, licenses, options, and startups. And Columbia, as you can see, uh, sort of plays in the same level as our peer institutions. I'm presenting here some of the products that are on the market now that use Columbia technology. On the left, maybe the ones that are more interesting to this group, since this is a, the Cancer Center uh, researchers. Uh, those are the health, health sciences uh, inventions, uh, like Zalatan, Remicade, you may be familiar with. On the right are more from our physical science in the Morningside, Morningside campus. Um, and what is meant by the inclusion of things like Blu-ray discs and Dish Network, often those, those are uh, rooted in uh, video encoding technologies that came from the, from the university. So first question here, and I've learned to just include this slide um, because it's typically I get interrupted at this point and ask, and ask where all this funding goes through, or the revenue that the university receives goes to. So um, this is actually part of our uh, university policy. It's in the uh, faculty handbook as voted on by the faculty center. Um, for the first $125,000 that the university receives, 40% uh, goes to the inventor pool. If there is one inventor, it's just the inventor, but if there are several inventors, which is usually the case, there's an inventor pool. 20% will go to the inventor labs, 20% uh, to our office, and 20% goes to the university at large. Uh, once you're over $125,000 uh, in gross revenue, then the inventor pool is diminished by, uh, by half. It goes to 20%, and that 20% that was taken off is distributed around the university, school, and department. And, and this is, I would say, this is pretty, sim this is pretty much in line with uh, what, what a lot of our peer institutions uh, do. And a lot of this information is public. This is available on our website and in the faculty handbook. So how do you get started? Again, file an inventor report. This is one point I try to emphasize in these talks. This is really the best way to get started on something that you think might be an invention or uh, a discovery that is, is, has commercial applications. Uh, and it really allows us to sort of get the, get the ball rolling. Um, and I'll show you what it looks like, what technology transfer actually looks like um, along this, um, this timeline. So discovery is first, obviously, or, or development by the, um, by the research lab. Once an intervention report is filed, it kicks off this second process, which is um, Columbia Tech Ventures uh, reviews the IP, reviews the, uh, the invention, looks at, does an IP analysis. So this is done by our uh, legal counsel, both internal and external. We conduct our own commercial analysis, which looks at what the development stage is, what the potential market is, what the challenges may be. And finally, we have a invention review meeting uh, within a few weeks of submitting the invention report in which we uh, review the invention and sort of as a group, this, this, this meeting includes the inventors, our, our patent counsel, and the licensing officers, myself. And then we, in this meeting, we try to come up with a strategy for patenting and commercialization which is really informed by um, both the commercial and IP analysis. So to really understand tech transfer, it, it is important to have an appreciation for what patenting is. And as uh, I've noticed over the years, uh, it is helpful to, to provide a quick primer on what a patent is. And um, because a lot of researchers actually don't, aren't really aware, they, they're sort of aware of the general concept of what a patent is, um, but not necessarily on the specifics. So a patent is a national legal protection for an invention. So each of those words is important. National meaning there is no such thing as a worldwide patent. There is no such thing as an international patent. All patents are only applicable to the specific country in which they were nationalized. Um, and it's for an invention. An invention is a solution to a real world problem that works for its intended purpose. And that becomes really important when you try to talk about what is patentable and what is not patentable. So what, is it, what right does a patent 
grant the inventor or the institution of the, uh, of the inventor or the owner of the patent. A patent is just an exclusive right to prevent others from practicing the invention. Practicing meaning making, using, selling, importing, or offering to sell. And it's a time-limited right. It only lasts 20 years from the date of filing. So the first question that you have to ask yourself anytime you're considering filing a patent is, is an invention patentable? And for that, there's really uh, four hurdles or four uh, you know, aspects of the invention that you want to uh, study. First, is it patentable subject matter? So typically, patentable subject matter will be you know, some new composition of matter, a new drug, something that nobody's ever created before, maybe an apparatus. It could also be a method of manufacturing. It can be a method of doing something. Uh, essentially, it needs to solve a problem. Um, it is often more useful to, to describe what isn't patentable. Things that are not patentable in the United States, at least, are abstract concepts. So algorithm, an algorithm, an algorithm by itself is not patentable. Uh, natural laws. Um, this, this is of particular importance uh, in the cancer world when you start talking about diagnostics and biomarkers. Um, if an invention is essentially a description of a natural law, then it, is, it, it goes into a much trickier territory of patent law as, as to what is actually patentable. Um, second is utility. It needs to be useful. Um, this is actually probably a lower bar than most of you um, are, are familiar with when it comes. So the bar for showing that something is useful for the patent office is lower than, sh than the bar for peer review. So, you know, typically in utility, you want to just show that it works once and that's usually pretty good for the patent office. Uh, third is novelty. So that must mean that nobody has created exactly what you have created or what you're claiming is an invention. Another way of thinking about this is that there's no prior art. And I'll go into this in the next slide about what prior art really is and why you want to look at prior art when you're thinking of filing a patent. And the final one is probably the most gray concept to, to get a hold of here. It's non-obviousness. It, it, the idea here is that you can't make an obvious improvement to a currently existing invention. Um, and it has to be you know, obvious to somebody skilled in the art. So if you are making sort of a, if you're looking at a, a chemical compound and you're making what may be considered a obvious modification to an existing compound, um, it, the patent office will typically uh, reject such a claim. And this is where a lot of the arguments in the patent office actually, you know, boil down to it's whether it's, it would be obvious to a person skilled in the art to have made that uh, modification. So what is prior art? And the reason I, I mentioned this is because prior art really is meant to be all encompassing. It is any description, any thing that has been written down or put in a tangible form that describes your invention, that describes some, the, the, the possibility that, or the, that teaches that your invention may be already known by the time that you filed it. Um, so I like to give this example. So this was a, an engineer in Denmark, I believe in the 1950s, uh, came up, he, he was mainly in charge of rescuing sunken ships such as these um, from the ocean floor. He came up with the idea of filling it with inflatable uh, or inflatable balls or plastic balls that you can, you know, you would essentially fill the ship, make it more buoyant and make it easier to recover, um, which seems like a reasonable enough invention. Things that you might, you know, if you're a patent examiner here, you're gonna, you're, you wanna look at the prior art to make sure that nobody else has come up with this. So your first ideas might be, well, of course you're gonna look at other patents. You're gonna look at other patent applications that may not have been issued. Those count as well. Publications count. So are there publications on this? Um, are there, if somebody submitted an abstract to a scientific conference with this method, those are all the things that you wanna look at. But moreover, and I show this really to, to, to show that, that um, it is supposed to be an all-encompassing definition. Uh, in this case, the patent examiner in Denmark found that there was a Donald Duck cartoon from 1949 in which they described this exact invention, filling up a, 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 a ship that was at the bottom of the ocean um, with plastic balls and making it more boring and lifting it. And this patent was actually rejected on the basis of this cartoon. So, I'll now go into a few final notes on prior arts. That doesn't, it does include works that you have published. 
if you have published on an invention um, that is considered prior art against the uh, patent that you're filing. So if it was public at the time you filed it with the patent office, um, that is considered, for most of the world, it's considered a time bar on being able to, uh, uh, to get that patent granted. And again, that includes conference abstracts, seminars that are open to the non-Columbia public, bio-archive submissions are public. This is tweets describing your invention, Facebook posts describing your invention. This is all public information. And you should keep that in mind. I will add one big caveat is that the United States, and I believe the United States alone, um, provides a one-year grace period. If you're the inventor and you publicly disclose your invention and then you file a patent, the United States gives you one year. It is just one country, but it is frankly the largest market in the world. Um, so it is still a valuable um, potential uh, patent filing. So keep that in mind if you, do, if you have actually filed on your invention and, and it's been less than a year, then it is still potentially patentable. So in short, please talk to our office, file an invention report before you disclose. And just really quickly, I wanna go through a real patent because this is usually also a, a good exercise. If you look at a patent um, like this one, uh, it'll have a title page, it'll have drawings, detailed description, claims, and everything else. Um, the drawings can be useful from a legal perspective. My understanding and our experience has been, you, you really do wanna look at the claims. The claims are the intellectual property real estate that you are claiming with your invention. The patent here is actually, what we, you know, is often called a vanity patent is a patent describing a mousetrap in the shape of a cat. Um, I'm not entirely sure why you would want your mousetrap to look like a cat because you would assume that mice would run away from a cat. Okay, without going into details, let's just look at the claims on this patent. Um, because again, patents are really the key to getting uh, an, uh, a legal protection for your invention. It, it really is the intellectual real estate and it's what, what is gonna get litigated if you actually go to court, it's, what, it's gonna be all focused on the claims. So the claims for this patent are, and I won't read it all, but I'll give you the general flavor, a portable electrical mousetrap for capturing and killing a mouse comprising a housing in the shape of a cat with a pair of eyes and a mouth. So this first claim is what you're going to see as is the first independent claim in the patent. Uh, again, if you wanna show off to your friends and show that you know how to read or you know how to like evaluate a patent, you just go straight to the claims and read the first claim. And that's usually um, the most important sort of paragraph or, or term in the entire patent application. A good heuristic um, I found is the longer a patent claim, the less valuable it is um, because that entire claim has to be satisfied in order for, to, for somebody to be infringing on your patent. So just looking at the first, cent, the first little phrase here, if somebody develops a shaping in the housing, a, a mousetrap in the shape of a cat that has a single eye, that is already different from a pair of eyes and doesn't really, isn't necessarily covered by this claim. So please keep that in mind. Um, claims are really what you wanna look at when you're looking at patents. So how much and how long does it take to file a patent? So it's always good to get a sense of what the timeline is here. So uh, a lot of the costs are, for a patent are front loaded. A typical estimate is 50 to $100,000 per country from the moment you file the patent to the moment it is, it's issued. Uh, and most of this expense is really gonna come at the beginning when you're drafting the patent, filing the patent and going through patent prosecution. Patent uh, maintenance fees, so you know the fees to get the patent issued, the fees to maintain the patent, those are fairly small. But really what you're running up costs on are paying attorneys to draft your patents and to prosecute the patents in the patent office. Uh, sort of prosecution of a patent is what is, typically, what is referred to as really the negotiation you enter into the, with the patent office on what claims will actually get issued. Um, as a side note, I really do recommend that you if you're, unless you are a patent attorney or patent, you know, somebody trained in patents, not to try to file your own patent, not to try to draft your own patent. You wanna work, this is a legal document and it's an incredibly, it can be an incredibly important business asset for uh, any company. And if you're gonna go through the, through the trouble of filing a patent, make sure to do it with a patent attorney. That would be my general advice. A uh, typical issue, you know, time from filing the patent to getting it issued is about five years. It says three to five, I would say probably five years. 
often depending on how, how much back and forth you have to go into with the patent office. Okay, so that was a quick primer on patenting. And you know, once we've decided how we're gonna proceed with the invention, whether we decide to patent it or not, oftentimes we, we will still market it and try to find a commercial partner for the, for the invention. Uh, then we enter the process of, of uh, marketing and, and identifying a company and negotiating a license agreement with that company. So I'll go into a little bit of detail about what this license negotiation typically looks like. Licensing IP really is not like buying a car. Um, IP is a much more uh, difficult to really define the value of than uh, uh, a you know, physical asset like a car. Uh, there's uncertain quality. Uh, you know, we, often at the time that you're licensing a patent, it actually hasn't been issued. You're only licensing a patent application and the potential full patent that may result from that patent application. So at the time of licensing, the company may not even be sure uh, what claims are actually going, going to issue. And it might not be clear exactly how enforceable the patent is even when, when it does issue with presumably valuable claims. There's also uncertain commercial value be, uh, uh, for, the, for the IP because, you know, to, as I said, university IP really, really is on the bleeding edge. Um, often it will take five to 10 years to actually develop a product and who knows where the industry may be in five to 10 years. Um, this is particularly the case in, in the physical sciences where, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you develop an invention in 2005, it is really hard to tell what your, what the software landscape, what the uh, uh, telecommunications landscape, what the, you know, material science landscape is gonna look like in, in 2015. Um, it's also a longer asset life. Usually patents are licensed early on. So we're still talking, you know, 15 to 18 years of patent life left by the time it's licensed. And license agreements, as a result of all this sort of uncertainty that's surrounding it really uh, tend to be pretty complicated. They tend, there's a lot of economic terms that need to be negotiated. This is why our patent agreement, patent, sorry, why our license agreements are typically very complex. 18 pages long, I would say, is probably a minimum for an exclusive patent license. Um, they're typically uh, easily arranged into the 30 pages, and that's before you start adding exhibits. So um, they also involve the, you know, the balancing and, and the combination of both legal and business issues. So these are very, very complicated agreements. Um, I will mention briefly, I mentioned option agreements early on. Option agreements tend to be these time-limited six to 12 month agreements um, that are meant to uh, provide a company with an exclusive right to negotiate a license later on. The reason that they're very attractive is because they're usually like four, four pages long with, a uh, with an attachment of a term sheet that is itself maybe two or three pages long. It's a lot easier to, especially at the early stage, we're not, you're not quite sure about the quality of the patent or you're not quite sure if this is actually gonna work out. It's easier to negotiate this option that's, you know, five to six pages long, uh, and then resolve that if you agree to move forward in a year, um, you're gonna work on the actual 30 page agreement, a full license agreement. So the negotiation that we enter into for these for, with companies, which really is between Columbia and and a potential licensee, it really has to balance a lot of issues. So while we're both agree that, you know, we wanna make sure everyone understands what's going on, uh, what, the, what the rights and obligations are, and that um, th we wanna make, make the, the agreement sort of as predictable as possible, there are a lot of disagreements. So as a licensor, Columbia is trying to have higher commercial terms, more money, more upfronts, higher royalties. The licensor obviously wants lower payments to, 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 to Columbia. Um, we want to typically limit um, what the field of the license is. So if we're uh, licensing, let's say, a platform for the treatment of uh, diseases that are, have a genetic basis, like this is a very broad platform, and if our licensor is typically just a, cancer, a company that focuses on cancer indications, we may want to negotiate with a company that they can only make, they can only use the technology for cancer indications. And then we can go off and find comp a company that's interested in cardiology, cardiology, interested in maybe uh, neurological indications. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, we always want our licensees to make our technology the top priority, but you know the fact of the matter is that things change a lot in five to ten years, and the, and the licensee 
the company may find that it wants to deprioritize your technology. Um, this is something that we tend to uh, have to do a lot of back and forth in with the companies because um, we, Columbia, typically will want a mechanism to remove or to either uh, terminate the license or make the license or change the terms of the license in the case where the company is not performing. We don't want, we want to be the least, we want less exposure to the company failure. We also want uh, during prosecution for the patent for, for the patent to be very broad. Um, of course, this is broad uh, while the company is paying for patent prosecution. So the company may actually want to limit how much, how broad the claims are because it, you know, it costs them money to actually continue to prosecute the patent. So generally speaking, we want Columbia as a licensor, and this is the case for all licensors, wants protection from product liability lawsuits and the company wants to minimize their insurance costs. So, so really the takeaway from this is there's a lot of things that we're aligned in with the company. We want this product to succeed, but there's also a lot of disagreements and those simply have to be negotiated. The main financial terms, I'll just put them here, there's upfront fees, annual fees, sub-licensing, equity. This is particularly true in startups and I'll, I'll go into startups in a bit. Equity has become a much more important part of our licenses um, since we're doing more deals with startups. Uh, milestones, these are typically milestones payments are payments based on um, the development process, progress of the company. So for a drug, there's usually typically a milestone payment for um, when the company enters phase one, when the company enters phase two, when it finally receives FDA approval. Those are the, typically are what um, milestone agreements uh, refer to. Uh, and royalties, uh, which really are um, a, a really strong focus of all of these agreements, are just a percent of net sales um, that the company that the Columbia will receive for sales um, that the that the product uh, makes. So, for every dollar that our product makes, we like to do, command a royalty on that sale. So, a quick word on startups, since I mentioned it. Um, IP is important to startups, but increasingly startups are even more important to IP. And this is a quote from one of our partners, uh, Mark Singer at Osage University Partners. Now over half of our licenses, uh, of Columbus exclusive licenses are to startups. And this makes sense, makes sense just from a conceptual basis. Startups really are a vehicle to manage risk. Columbia University Technologies, all university technologies are very risky endeavors at the beginning. And, a venture-backed startup really does, makes a lot of sense as the vehicle to take the technology from this risky early stage asset to a commercially validated and ideally regulatory approved um, product. So th there's really been an explosion in startups over the last couple of years at Columbia. Um, you know, tw 10 years ago, we would usually be doing uh, less than 10 startup deals a year. Now we're typically doing 20 or more. Um, and this is true for all universities. Um, there's been a 36% increase relative to license, uh, to license increases in general uh, that are gone to startups. So all universities around the country really are depending on startups more and more uh, to serve as the sort of um, licensee for its technologies. I did like to, would like to mention a recent study that came out from, uh, Auto, uh, from uh, Autumn's uh, data. Columbia is the second univer uh, most university with the most startups. So that's only behind MIT since in those 11 years, 2008 to 2018, Columbia had 194 startups. And this is from Autumn, which I should mention is the Association of University Technology Managers, which is the trade group for technology transfer uh, around the world. Um, so as I mentioned, really over half of CTV's exclusive licenses are not to start up. And here I'm presenting a couple of the examples. On the right, again, physical sciences. Uh, on the top left are more the health sciences, pharma, and devices. Uh, some of you may be familiar with some of these companies, but frankly, typically a, a lay audience would, would not be familiar with these companies. And that's just typically for uh, how biotech and um, these early stage startups work. Um, the vast majority of startups um, usually plan to be acquired or to go IPO. Uh, they, they don't actually, they mostly plan to be acquired around phase two or phase three um, by a pharma company, more established big pharma companies you may have heard of. So 
Um, a lot of the drugs, for example, that you see now that may be marketed by a large company, a large pharma company like Lilly or Pfizer or Merck, um, a lot of those may have actually been uh, acquired from a startup that no longer operates um, because the startups are really the ones that absorb that initial phase one, phase two risk. And the valley of death still applies for startups. Um, they're going through the same issue of trying to get funding at a stage where the technology asset may not be ready. So we try to make it our mission at Columbia Technology Ventures to launch more and stronger startups faster. And there's a couple of ways that we try to do that. So these are the resources that we have here at the university, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, we have an expanded uh, executive in residence um, program where a lot of executives that formerly worked in, in industry or maybe in between jobs help advise Columbia uh, faculty and Columbia, Columbia startups on, you know, maybe what the next step in validation may be, um, what, you know, where you could look for, for uh, feedback from the FDA or from regulatory bodies, things like that. So our executives and residents um, really a highly valued resource. And if you connect with us, we would be happy to sort of arrange a meeting um, with them. We also have the Academic Venture Exchange, which is taking these executive and residence networks that each university has and really expanding them to uh, a lot of our peer institutions. We also have our Graduate Student Fellows Program, which if you're interested in, uh, please do reach out. Uh, these are grad students and postdocs at Columbia that help analyze our incoming inventions. They help form a lot of special projects. They help with marketing campaigns. It's a really great experience for uh, researchers at Columbia to get some exposure to tech transfer and also to the sort of the commercial world in general. And of course, we do help connect our startups to venture investors. From just the aspect of trying to streamline licensing, we have a, uh, for our faculty startups, we do have startup friendly IP licensing deals. Typically, the idea here is to, to not front load a startup with, with a lot of fees. We try to share the risk with the startup. And in the same sense, we try to share the reward. So most of our licenses are, are structured so that there is the, the revenue that comes to Columbia will only be uh, towards the end or, or towards the later stages of the development. And as well, we have our own internal boot camps, intellectual property, class for entrepreneurs, and lectures and events on campus. I would be remiss not to mention our excellent Columbia Lab to Market Accelerator Network um, with, that is, exists for the purpose of really trying to improve and launch more and stronger startups from Columbia. Uh, and a lot of you may be familiar with them. Um, uh, so you may be familiar with Columbia, Bi Columbia Biomed X, used to be known as the Culture Program, which focuses more on medical devices. They're Columbia's, this is Columbia's Translational Therapeutic Accelerator. Um, the Herbert Irving Cancer Center has the ACT, which uh, Ema uh, and Tanisha manage, which is the Accelerating Cancer Therapeutics. So these are all accelerators that are really trying to make sure that the technologies and startups that are coming from Columbia are more prepared, stronger, have, have a better idea of, uh, of what is you know, successful asset or successful like a model for their technologies. And I've included a couple of the data, a couple of the um, performance metrics on the bottom, which I'll, I'll let you read, but it really has, they have been an incredible success um, for the office and for Columbia. CTV, though, really is just, I want to emphasize, it's just one part of the broader Columbia entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem. There's, of course, uh, the Columbia Business School. There is Columbia Entrepreneurship um, uh, Organization CEO. There's a lot of other, you know, players in this, like this Columbia Engineering School, um, who we work with to really try to, you know, serve as a part of the Columbia Entrepreneurship and Innovation ecosystem within the university. Um, I would like to leave a final note. I've talked a lot about financial terms and a lot about um, revenue coming into Columbia, but I really do want to emphasize that that's not really necessarily the, the, the driving focus for all this. Um, technology transfer really is about converting inventions into products, um, enabling industry partnerships for, with scientific researchers, attracting and retaining faculty and students, encouraging entrepreneurship at Columbia, uh, training the next generation of uh, tech business leaders, uh, improving the local and national economy, being responsive to the government's desires uh, that Columbia inventions be uh, commercialized and really translated to the, to the wider world. And, that, and maybe, of course, 
revenues, usually many, many years after the fact. Um, most of our, you know, major licenses uh, only produce revenue, you know, eight to 10 years after the license agreement is signed. So if you want to learn more, I really encourage you to visit our website. Uh, feel free to email me. Um, I'll take questions now. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, uh, John. That was uh, terrific. And I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, as uh, John mentioned, um, I'm involved with the Acceleration Cancer Therapeutics uh, Program. And I have to say, CTV are phenomenal partners. Lab to Market are phenomenal partners. So I would encourage anyone on this call who's interested in learning more to reach out and connect with, with CTV. Um, and with this great team. Um, we have one question here on the chat that's come in. Please, as, uh, as we're answering this one, uh, please drop your questions in. Uh, so this question, if an inventor moves to a different university, how does this influence the patent invention status? And what is the role of the new university? So that's a great question. So the invention at the time that it is created and filed on by the university, that remains uh, Columbia uh, invention. So from that perspective, um, the inventor is still involved, obviously, um, but there is no change to the patent status because the inventor moved universities after the filing of the patent or after the, in, uh, the actual uh, inventive stage of the patent. Uh, the university, you know, it really varies. Uh, in some cases, the new university may, may not have um, any, any additional input to this. So in those cases, it is possible that uh, any license that is signed for that patent doesn't involve the new university. But really, often the nature of research is that um, when you move to a new university, you're still continuing your previous research. So there may be new innovations at your new university that altogether may need Columbia's IP, may need the new university's IP to really form a package that's um, valuable and enticing for a university, for a, for a for an investor or a company. In those cases, we sign, we, we negotiate and sign what we call inter-institutional agreements, and those are done on a case-by-case -case basis, and we do uh, dozens of those a year. And it really is for a way for the universities to jointly um, manage the technology and figure out how to really get the technology out there. But that's typically how it works um, in these cases. Thanks. Another question, after 20 years, can the patent be renewed? or will it be treated as a brand new patent? So a patent cannot be renewed. Um, this is, if you look at the whole spectrum of what IP protections are, um, you know, you, you may have heard of trademark, of copyright, uh, uh, patenting, trade secrets. Patents are by far the strongest protection that can be offered to any sort of intellectual property. It's also why they have the shortest lifetime. They have 20 years and it cannot be renewed at that point. Um, there may be ex uh, very minor extensions offered um, uh, or, or market exclusivity offered for drugs, but those are actually come from the FDA. They don't come from the patent office. Thanks. Um, uh, a question uh, that might be tangential, um, but uh, how, how does one and who is the contact for incoming MTA review and approval at, at uh, CUIMC? Is that with you guys, with another office? So our office does manage all material transfer agreement or the vast majority of material transfer agreements that come to universities, so to the university. Um, if you email either our office or literally mta at columbia.edu, uh, we'll be able to connect you to the right person. And so I would um, ask a question for, for new faculty who have just arrived, um, do, does your office reach out to new people? Should they come and contact you as soon as they arrive and start to get a feel for how they would integrate with your office and partner with your office? Should people wait till they feel they have something that might be an, an invention report or, or how would you advise um, individuals to connect? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All of them. Um, we, we'd like to, we like to talk to inventors or, or researchers as early as possible, sometimes just to get a sense for their research, tell them what kind of services our, our office can offer. Um, when it comes to just if you have a particular idea that you think may be an invention, I definitely recommend that you talk to our office early. Uh, in general, the earlier you talk to us, the, the easier it is to, and, the, and the better it is to sort of move forward on a new invention. So we try to reach out to some new faculty. Um, we encourage all new faculty to be able to reach out to us, although we do understand for new faculty, they have so much going, going at them in the first year that it can often be kind of difficult. 
And I have a, another question, um, and please, guys, feel free to uh, drop your questions in the chat or unmute yourselves. Um, how much do you find that you end up connecting individuals, that someone comes and talks to you or one of your colleagues in the office, and you end up connecting people with others at the university who they may not have known about, who may be working on something similar or, or may have a, a, a very productive interaction based on what you already know about the, the landscape at Columbia? You know that that ends up happening more than more than I you would think um, because really uh, so from for the licensing team and for the for the for the staff in general we end up getting exposed to a lot of different kind of research so it is definitely the case that we've had uh, professors come up to us and say that you know, I'm working on this research but I'm really just trying to find a let's say a, a working mouse model for diabetes that doesn't have this particular problem. And when we discuss it in staff meeting, you know, that specific licensing officer may not be aware of it, but when we discuss it in staff meeting, it might end up that, you know, we do know somebody that has the exact solution. So it ends up being kind of another way of trying to be a valuable resource to our faculty that um, to be able to connect with, connect them to other researchers that may be doing something that may be of interest. Great. I had a feeling that that was the case. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so are there any other questions? I don't see anything on the chat box. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself or, or add a question here. Um, while I'm waiting for you guys, actually I just popped down your screen there, uh, Joanne, and I can, uh, I can put up a closing, a closing um, slide. Um, so um, just to let you guys know, and again, if you have questions, uh, please uh, let us know. Um, I would like to very much thank uh, Joan for uh, this talk uh, today. And of course, if you have questions after the fact, um, his email was there on the last slide. And if you reach out to us, we can give it to you if you, if you missed that. Um, next week, we continue. Um, we continue. We have a, a very um, a nice uh, set of talks next week. On Tuesday, we will have our community outreach and engagement group joining us to talk about how they can help to make your cancer research relevant to the Cancer Center's catchment area. Those are the areas around around us uh, that we serve and the, and the populations that we serve as a cancer center. That's on Tuesday. And then next Wednesday, we will have another in our research in progress uh, seminar series with um, two uh, new or recent members from the Cancer Population Science Program, Alexandra Melamed and Natalie Moses. So we would encourage everyone to join us next week. And um, please uh, feel free to reach out to Joanne. A couple of very, thank you very much is coming in there. So um, I think, uh, uh, everyone enjoyed the talk, so <laughs> that was wonderful. So thank you very much, John. Thank you to everyone for joining us, and I wish everybody um, a good evening. Brilliant. Thanks, Emer. Take care. Bye-bye.